I would like to go ahead and uh, share this land acknowledgement with all of you. We would like to acknowledge the Lenape, who are the original inhabitants of Lenape Hoking, and the island of Manahata, the land the New School University is built upon, including all of New York City, present day New Jersey, and eastern Pennsylvania, along the Delaware River watershed, western Long Island, and the lower Hudson Valley, comprise Lenape ancestral homeland. This land was not ceded nor sold as folklore would have us believe to the Dutch for beads and trinkets. This land was forcibly taken through occupation by European settlers resulting in displacement, forced migration and genocide. In the present day, there are Lenape communities throughout North America, though much of the original Lenape territory remains under settler occupation and control. As settlers who have benefited from the colonization of sovereign land, we acknowledge our responsibility to examine and question systems of opp oppression that continue through to the present day and educate ourselves about the original stewards of this land. We also want to acknowledge the iron workers of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, mostly from the Mohawk tribe, whose la labor built the many iconic skyscrapers and steel bridges in New York City as recently as 2012. About 200 of the 2000 structural iron workers in New York City were Mohawk. Every day we view the city skyline of Manhattan, we are reminded of their contribution. And so with that, I'm going to uh, welcome all of you to Cloud Salon. Most of you know who I am. I am Catherine Mori Waki, one of the full-time faculty here at Carson School of Design. And we have a uh, wonderful speaker joining us today that I am so delighted to be able to introduce to all of you. Um, this is uh, Grace Jun, and Grace Jun is an assistant professor at the University of Georgia, UGA. Researching design processes inclusive of disability, specifically exploring accessibility in interaction design and adaptive fashion. She connects her research to design and disability communities as CEO of Open Style Lab, a Smithsonian National Award winning nonprofit organization that creates designs inclusive of disability. Her teaching practice is focused on helping people develop creative strategies to apply inclusive design principles and critically think about the social implications of disability in a design process. Before joining UGA, she taught at the New School, Parsons School of Design, and has guest lectured at MIT, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania. Earlier in her career, she was UX designer and design strategist for mobile device research team at Samsung Electronics Limited in South Korea. A recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts, she also serves on jury committees and organizations that advance the arts and design. And with that, I am so delighted to welcome Grace. Oh, thanks so much, Catherine. Um, I think I'll start with sharing my screen uh, and we'll get right into it. If everyone could see. How's this? All right. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, again, I'm Grace. Thanks, Catherine. I see Colleen. Thank you, DT, for inviting me to the Cloud Salon talk. It's It's been a while <laughs> since I, I've been kind of connected with Parsons virtually. So I'm kind of excited uh, to, to really see how we can discuss things for, for more people and um, for especially students around disability and design. And I hope everyone could hold off for just some questions probably halfway after uh, my presentation. So my research focus, uh, first of all, is divided into two things. It's adaptive fashion, and I'll briefly explain. Uh, it's really around fashion that is inclusive with people with disabilities, particularly clothing. Uh, and accessories. And number two is how to co-design and what those co-design processes look like with people living with disabilities. So uh, you'll see this abbreviation PLWD that means people living with disabilities. And I um, further apologize in case if I just walk right through it and just say PLWD without stopping, but please note this. So number one, for adaptive fashion, um, this is a really great quote that I always kind of reference that, you know, regardless of if it's fashion for disability or fashion for all types of bodies and people, it's really about a vehicle for self-expression. And if some people are marginalized and not able to express fully who they wish to be, how they wish to present themselves, you know, those are some barriers of inaccessibility that I think are worth examining as creatives and designers today. 
Number two, uh, co-design processes, so designing inclusive of disability. Uh, in theory, you know, it all sounds great, uh, but how to do it is often sometimes messy, complicated, exciting, and different for every person's experience. But some of the takeaways that I think it really provides is that it creates values and it pro pro proves that design really drives value. And number two, it increases com compliancy for longer usage of certain products and services that are inclusive for people with disabilities. And three, of course, reduces stigma by the very process of including someone uh, with a disability. So those are the two, um, I guess, lenses that I'll be talking about today. And how I've approached that is some of my recent work. Um, you might have seen this. Uh, it was in the Washington Post on how to sew your own fabric mask. And I had approached this problem mainly because I got approached by Washington Post, but I happened to have been living in my apartment during the pandemic and really thinking about certain solutions um, based on the limited resources we had. So this design uh, was collaborated with one of my board members and friend, Christina Mellon, on how to kind of make a, a fabric mask using limited resources, but also um, that when it's constructed, that it's kind of a standing alone. So you're able to kind of fit your face in it hands-free. And so the way it's constructed, the way it's stitched and the patterns um, are adjustable for different face lengths and widths, but it's also meant to be um, pretty much cut in a, in a certain direction. So you can check that out. <laughs> um, but most of the framework that kind of influences my work is really three things. It's about the body, the object, and the space. And especially I'm looking at the object through extensions, wearables, adaptive fashion. And some examples of an extension of the body is like the wheelchair or different types of assistive devices. Wearables could also expand into prosthetics. And of course, adaptive fashion includes clothing. So these are just some of the ways that I kind of uh, look at the landscape of adaptive fashion within the other practices that it is following. Um, much of the history is influenced by universal design and of course, um, the ADA compliance. Uh, that has already been prominent in environment and architectural studies. And of course, the body really looks and examines at how we, we see not just the, the kinetics of the body, but also what clothes it. So this is hopefully going to be maybe helpful for some people who are thinking and researching um, into this field. So when we reimagine bodies and ideas of fit, I'll start with bodies. Um, I think of a few designers who already make things that kind of question, you know, what is the idealized body? What is not? And so whether it's not disability, it's really kind of examining uh, how we approach, you know, a different just lens, a perspective on what the body means. And so I think on the Carsant, Rick Owens do this quite well on challenging these notions. Uh, while they're not designing for disability in mind per se, they've already kind of deconstructed this idealized sense uh, that we don't really fit into a very particular mold, that we can be as fluid and as dynamic as the clothes that dress and adorn our diverse bodies. Other ways that I've seen, I guess, body and clothing uh, research is looking at transformative and modular clothing. Uh, Hussein Chaline on the very top image really looks at like dress becoming a part of furniture. Um, where does the boundary between body and your space uh, kind of become blurry? And on the bottom, there is Multiples, which was a brand of modular clothing in the 1980s, where it's really looking at different ways to get dressed using the same type of clothing and article. So there are different ways where I think um, fabric, space, and body collide. And it has been more prominent, of course, in different studies of fashion. But of course, you could see that it is um, really something that's highlighted in disability as well whether it's not really well documented or not as acknowledged. So on the very, uh, I guess on my right side is Helen Cookman. And Helen Cookman was a disabled designer in the 1960s who had designed um, a pair of pants that were more easily to be able to be put on in a seated position and to have access when using the bathroom. And so these pants are on the US patent. Um, you can just Google it as well. And it's, it was a collaboration with Levi's. And so this is one of the earliest examples that I kind of touch upon as a collaboration between someone with a disability and of course, mainstream fashion uh, retailers and companies. 
And this is important because uh, some of the work that I'm currently doing is looking at the context of adaptive clothing uh, throughout American history in 1930 to 1970 in particular. And number two, adaptive designers and retailer examples today. And three, the design approaches and processes that are currently happening that are worth highlighting and to share for more students and for, of course, more designers to reference. So at Parsons, uh, I'll take a step back from my research. I wanted to take a trip down memory lane and say I've done my thesis as well at DT. Um, for many of you who are about to do your thesis or you know, at your last year in, in Parsons DT, it's been kind of quite the ride <laughs> from boot camp to really figuring out what you want to present. And so these are a few snippets of some of my work that I have been doing for my thesis. I'm making garments for women who have breast cancer surgery. And so I focused on working with um, SHARE, which was a breast cancer organization. And I ended up making seven jackets. And the last one had uh, these microcontrollers, which if you're familiar with Arduino and um, other types of sensors that help kind of track your arm motion. And this was important because the collaborator I was uh, working with, Dorothy, um, who had post breast cancer surgery was still experiencing pain. And the way she documented her pain uh, to communicate with her physical therapist was just verbal. Uh, it was sometimes written. And so I thought there was a better way to use technology and to collect data that might accurately present how Dorothy was feeling and her levels of pain throughout a week to better communicate with her therapist. So. That was my thesis. I also taught at Parsons School of Design uh, for about five years. Gosh, it's been <laughs> it's been recent since my transition. But one of the biggest classes that I was able to teach um, was in collaboration with the nonprofit that I'm working with today, called Open Style Lab. Uh, it was featured on the New York Times. If you guys want to read about it, uh, it shows some example of student work as well. And in this class, uh, a group of students are always. Uh, paired with a person with a disability who I'm inviting as a friend, as a colleague and a mentor, and they become a co-creator in that process. And so most of the outcomes were ranging from anything that's wearable, whether they're using different types of technology or they're simply re-examining you know, how we interact with clothing and the body. Uh, this course was offered um, first at DT and then it was offered at the School of Fashion. So these are some of the highlights where the course have been featured. And I think they're notable because it goes from, you know, Vogue to NYU Steinhardt for their um, occupational therapy department who they've generously volunteered um, some of their PhD students to, to mentor and to guest lecture. And also Metropolis Magazine, which was an architecture uh, and arts and design magazine as well. So. This is important to me because it shows how interdisciplinary um, this type of work is. So a little bit about Open Style Lab. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, it's a 501c3. Uh, and the goal is to really make style accessible for all people. And it was launched at MIT in 2014. And it's kind of received a lot of national recognition. And this is a photo of myself with two of my board members, Christina Mellon and Pinar Gavanch. Uh, as we received the Cooper Hewitt uh, Emerging Designer Award in 2019. Um, we really decided to focus on style and we were acknowledged for that um, because we believe that it has the power to change stigma surrounding disability. And how we've accomplished this is through events and brand partnerships, um, from making exhibitions to joining Maker Fair, to collaborating with the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, uh, and to working with like Ikea or other corporations to really talk about design and disability in different spaces. So one example um, is the Cooper Hewitt um, partnership um, collaboration with Open Style Lab. And we did a workshop at the museum uh, that kind of really looked at families and kids to see how we could reimagine uh, the way people see the body. And so we laser cut a couple of stencils in different body forms, um, different garments to really see how people wanted to think about adaptive fashion. Um, and especially if they identified having a disability themselves, how they could have better visual representation of their body. Uh, and through this workshop, we collaborated um, with the public as well as had a public talk uh, with a few people. So the other factor that we also do other than um, you know, different types of events is education. 
And Open Style Lab has been known to have a summer program with engineers, designers, occupational and physical therapists to co-design with various people with living disabilities. And so some of the outcomes that came from the summer program were adaptive garments. And this was one created with Ryan DeRoche uh, on looking at rain jackets that were accessible for not only people with disabilities, but also for bike riders in Cambridge. Um, and so there were a lot of factors where you can see a combination of material sciences, uh, actual construction of the garment, and you know really about the usability that it could be more accessible for more people. Um, it was replicated at Parsons, the, the summer program through some of my teaching uh, and some of the works that had happened um, resulted in student collaborations and some of my friends and peers and colleagues with disabilities. Uh, right here is Christina Mellon, who is wearing a green sweater and she uh, has around her neck this 3D printed device where back in the day when we didn't have some of the easier <laughs> Metro card devices, um, she, she had faced difficulty in New York subways to get to work um, because there wasn't anything that was hands-free to be able to go through the MetroCard station. So herself um, and Julia Liao, who was a product design student at Parsons, uh, Claudia Poe, who was a fashion design student, and Estee Bruno, who was a Parsons DT student, uh, decided to make a garment as well as a, this necklace as part of their semester-long project. And so this is a few examples of some of their prototype iterations. Another great collaboration was um, with Colleen Roche, who is a writer and disability activist. Um, Colleen worked with also, again, Parsons students at that time who are now Parsons alumni, Yi Yun Gao, Kalyani, Tupraki, and Yu Yi. Uh, all three uh, have combined their research and their enthusiasm to work with Colleen to think of a storage solution. So they created a, a bag um, that could be worn as a crossbody, but also fit onto the arm of her electric wheelchair. So overall, um, there are some resources, you know, other than uh, the examples that I'm showing you from the past previous class, the National Endowments for the Arts has a great report on disability and design that came out in 2021. Um, I have one co-authored book with um, Dr. Janine Tan, uh, that's also at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, but also I think if you Google it, there's a, a free link <laughs> through the Hong Kong Poly Technic Institute University that you could download. And Open Style Lab also has annual research journals um, that they've been producing to share some of that research on like topics like co-dressing or assistive technology. Um, finally, um, Crather knows this, but I've been working on a book for a very long time. So next year, if you have a chance, uh, in August, 2023, Fashion Inclusive Disability, the first book that I've just written alone is published by Barry, and it'll be out uh, in stores. So thank you so much uh, for your time. And I hope I could just leave a little bit more, uh, more time also to answer questions or have a better discussion. Um, thanks a lot for having me. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Grace, uh, for, um, you know, this talk. It was really exciting to see the work that you've been doing and to uh, get a sense of just really the, the kinds of um, design challenges, the communities of practice that you're working with. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's really great stuff. I think what I'm going to do is primarily open this to um, and questions, if anybody has them, and I, I always have questions, but, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold my questions to see if anyone else actually wants to, um, wants to start us off. Who will be the brave soul? <laughs> I will say you can also ask your question in the chat if you, um, do not want to, Unmute yourself now. Uh, feel free to go ahead and type out your question. I have a question. Um, well, has there been any time where um, have there been any times where you designed something that you thought was useful but ended up being kind of useless for the people with like special needs or the disabled community? Oh, yes, 100%. I think um, designing is such an iterative process. So there were many times I've 
seen from myself and also from students that I've worked with and past alumni, some things just don't work. And then you go back and you try to reiterate uh, and you take a step back, maybe two steps back to, to go back to something of an idea that uh, would maybe work a little bit better. Um, I think it's really endless. Sometimes even final outcomes, even, I don't know if you feel this way, but I never feel like my work is ever finished. <laughs> and so there's always room for improvement. I think the biggest takeaway I've had though is um, throughout this collaborative experience is if the person with the disability and the students really have learned something, at least one thing from that process, uh, and if they had actually enjoyed hopefully that process. And so I hope those two things are also enough. Okay, so we have some activity in the chat here. This um, we have we have one question from uh, Sidzel. Um, Thank you for an inspiring talk. Can you share more about the co-design process? What kind of activities do you do? And how slash when do you involve people living with disabilities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think similar to the summer program, uh, I'll talk about Open Style Lab summer program. We usually uh, kind of start recruiting various people, whether you're still in college and graduate school or young or older professionals, doesn't matter what age, um, early on uh, to kind of set up some teams. And then we introduce people with disabilities probably like almost the second week of that program. Uh, we do it early because it's really important to kind of establish a relationship. Um, given you guys know a semester is only like 15 weeks, so it's very short. Uh, during that time, even before then, um, a lot of, I guess, readings and uh, some background information around disability rights, uh, ADA compliance, universal design theory, um, inclusive design as a practice, all of those factors have to also be introduced. So it's sometimes overwhelming, I think, the first two weeks um, to, to be able to kind of catch up with all of that reading. Um, but that's that's kind of how the process begins. And then the rest is more of kind of looking at how to make some prioritization of designs. So if you're ever in a collaborative team, you know that some people have the skills that you don't, and you have some skills that others don't, and you have to do a lot of communicating. And so when that happens through discussions, how do you prioritize what you want to do for the end goal? Um, and so some of the observations in the very beginning with the collaborator with a disability, as well as with your own colleagues um, that you're working with is essential. And then unpacking that observation to be able to, you know, have a collaborative process that you agree on. And some of it uh, examines like ableist language, disability um, interpretation, how you look at the body and self-identity. Uh, that's determined as a team and then you move forward to design prioritization and then it's design iteration and then you fail as many times as possible <laughs> uh, and then hopefully get to an outcome that your team and yourself feel enough satisfaction to present uh, and to share so that's that was kind of the process of i think the summer program and the class that i could explain excellent we have another question in the chat here and this question is from sumi and uh, it says, I know you worked uh, with a lot of partners and collaborators, even as a student. Do you have tips for DT students in finding their communities of practice and reaching out to sources outside of DT? Yeah, um, I, I really think as a student, you have all the privileges to email randomly to people. And I took full advantage of that when I was a student. I simply blurted out that I was a Parsons graduate student and I was doing this project, just needed 30 minutes of this person's time to be able to discuss some of my ideas. And I think after doing that almost like 30 times, you, you'll find a group of people. Uh, I think putting yourself out there is a little bit tricky, right? But you don't know until you actually have those discussions. Like I remember being in like um, a disability and sex talk about like how women feel uh, sexuality and how they sexually identify themselves. And it was sponsored by the United um, Spinal Association. 
And when I was there, I was wondering, like, what am I doing here? But this is also super fascinating. And they're talking about lingerie. And so that kind of went down another rabbit hole around clothing, um, identity, about women, and of course, disability. And so, you know, you never know. That's like my most prime example of like, I didn't know what to expect, but I went in there with an open mind and tried to reach out to as many people. So I hope... Um, you guys could do the same, but maybe 30, 30 people or 30 emails is overwhelming, but uh, give it a shot. <laughs> I, I love that um, anecdote about, about persistence and, and grit. Um, it, it, takes a, it takes a lot of belief in, in your sort of ideas, right? A commitment uh, to, to be able to do that. So I'm curious if you could uh, sort of talk about um, when you were a student in DT, right? And you actually began working in this area. The, the area that you're now in was something that you were active, actively pursuing while you were um, um, while you were completing your graduate studies as well. So um, did you ever have moments where you questioned what you were doing, where you uh, were, thought that maybe you should pursue something else, uh, you know, if you could just sort of talk about the development of your ideas, because I think that it's such a great example of how the, this kind of commitment to a set of questions and a commitment to a really, you know, deep passion and interest uh, just developed into what is now such an incredibly robust and, um, and really inspiring sort of design body of work. Yeah, I think um, it looks really great always on the outside. Uh, and I rarely talk about some of the challenges of, I think, you know, working, not knowing, first of all, a lot of the answers to some of the questions or some of the, the things I'm sharing today and kind of going in being the person who doesn't know anything. Um, I think having that open you know, mindset and ability to just question has gotten me through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, if I ever felt like this, this why am I doing this? Like, I don't, I don't know why this is not working or um, why is this so difficult to start? You know, I just didn't stop with that question. I would, you know, consolidate all of that and be able to ask other peers or um, other people throughout some of the inquiries that, that went through my mind. And so I would say it's not, it wasn't easy whatsoever trying to start a company while everyone was glamorizing the startup world is totally not what I had expected. I did not come in with the intent of um, doing open style lab nor teaching. <laughs> I did not even expect to be teaching. And I think um, when you have kind of some inspiration and it's really personally tied to some of your values, you will find kind of an endless resource and well to continue what you do. But if it is not connected to you and the values that you uphold, I think it'll be very difficult because it'll disappear. Um, one of the things I think is, you know, we, we get interested in so many different topics. Uh, everything's always fascinating, but have some time to really think what things matter to you, but don't just stay stuck and keep asking, keep finding. And eventually, I think if you keep finding enough, you'll find a couple of roads uh, that will lead you hopefully to some unexpected, but very, um, I guess, uh, rewarding experiences. Oh my goodness, what a great answer. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we have another question in the chat here. Uh, this is from Amina. And the question is, what is something you had to unlearn in order to successfully uh, co-design and iterate uh, things or designs that were wanted and useful? That's such, again, really great questions. Um, I think one thing that really stands out because it's repetitive uh, that I've seen other people also unlearn and relearn is how to speak about disability. And I get this question a lot. So when I had first worked with different friends with disabilities, I realized I had made a couple of mistakes of assuming they wanted to be called a disabled person or a person with a disability. Um, when sometimes they're like, just call me by my name, Grace, or actually I just prefer my pronouns. Um, and not, I guess, asking first uh, was one of the, the big things that I had to unlearn uh, when I was co-designing. 
And also being able to take a step back and just let things happen naturally and not have the fear of like making that mistake, which I think most people are like uh, a little bit hesitant as well as myself to be like, well, I don't know if I should call this person this. And so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> and it's it's a prolonged wait. But that's uh, that's one example. We have, oh, another question popped up in the chat here. Uh, this is from Naima, and the question is, how do you identify gaps in the inclusion of people living with disabilities? Have you ever based a project on a firsthand concern about accessibility, or do you tend to work on the general issues in this realm? I think if I'm interpreting this question correctly, is like, am I coming at it with a personal, like, firsthand experience, or am I looking at it from as an, like, an observer? And I think I've done both. Um, I've experienced several temporary disabilities. And so uh, that alone was my example. I was the guinea pig at that moment to, to remake things. Um, but most of the time, I think I am the observer. And after, you know, I guess since 2014, what is it now? Eight years. Oh my God, it's been eight years. After eight years of watching the same thing in different forms, um, I start to pick up like some commonalities of like what I see are common frustrations. Uh, so those are the things that I share and um, learn also from Open Style Lab and some of the alumni at Open Style Lab. You know, what are some things that are frustrating around clothing? Uh, for example, getting dressed with very frustrating buttons that are tiny for someone who has uh, limited dexterity or paralysis in the fingers. Other things are like clothing that is difficult to wear. So it takes a lot of time, frustration and energy from the person who's wearing it. And those are like just a lot of things that after some time of just watching, I think I've gathered more knowledge, but really it's, it's kind of making some close friends as well. I don't think just my personal experience has shaped um, my research, or else I think I'd be in a very limited scope. But I started from that to then ask um, friends and colleagues with disabilities, like, hey, you know, I noticed you're like tucking in your shirt on the bottom on the side of your panel for your wheelchair. Like, why do you do that? You know, and like, is that uncomfortable? And just having those like natural discussions kind of provided me some insight on like what things were inaccessible related to clothes. Fabulous. We have a question from Mike V. Um, sitting with Colleen and John. <laughs> okay, so it's wonderful talk. I agree with that. Co-design can sometimes turn into design extraction. What steps do you take to ensure the people you are co-designing with are respected and don't feel that they are being mined for their ideas? Yeah, this is really great. Um, I think there are some processes that I've done where uh, there's like check-in points. Um, and it first starts with observation and of course a discussion. Literally the first day when the person with a disability is working with the students, um, they talk about what goals that they want to have, what ideas they both can share. So it's pretty, I think, if you do that for one hour, I think there's enough of an exchange of both sides of ideas and conversations. And then throughout the process, uh, especially the iteration phase, um, have kind of an analysis where it's it's also feedback, but it's more so the feedback of not just the design, but the process itself. And that's something that I think I've checked in more as the instructor to ask how comfortable the person that's collaborating with the students are feeling. Um, and I know it sounds like a very general question, but it's kind of what I think a lot of our you know, professors and educators are well equipped to do and is to really kind of check the temperature in the room and, uh, for lack of better words and really understand you know, what are some frustrations that are happening? Is there not enough dialogue that is being exchanged? Is there enough respect? Uh, are there challenges around equity of the space? I think more of the times it's not about the discussions, it's actually the actual space of a classroom that is frustrating. <laughs> For, for the people with disabilities who are collaborating with us. Um, so for example, if you invite someone to your home or to a workshop and you want to do this process, like you'll notice, you know, Parsons doors are very heavy. You can't even put a plug or like a, what is a door stopper underneath without like 
violating a fire hazard for more than one hour. Like those basic small things are important, especially when someone needs to use the restroom or take a break. Uh, and so I found that those were actually more of the inaccessible challenges in the co-design process about the space and that experience rather than the uh, discussions that were happening. But I could be wrong. <laughs> there were there were some moments where maybe a miscommunication happens, but it doesn't last more than 15 weeks. <laughs> Hope that's helpful. Yeah, would you share with us a little bit about what you are working on now? You did mention that you're writing a book and that's in, in process. Um, are there any projects that you are currently developing that you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, I think the book is definitely one. Um, I, I think while doing this book, I thought like this was a chance to organize everything I know and put it into nice fancy words, but it just showed me how much I don't know. <laughs> and I think while I was doing this book, um, I had the chance to, and the opportunity to really look at maybe where um, some of the intersections between universal design, you know, post-war, why there wasn't maybe more accessible clothing known or prominent after post-war, but like prosthetics and glasses were, you know, occurring. Um, and then, you know, looking at US, a patent database was also fascinating. So like some of that I think really helped shape and inform my own approach and thoughts around like, how do you encompulate like all of that to be able to share to students and to designers in general? Cause it comes from so many disciplines and it's really interdisciplinary. It can easily get political and it could easily get, uh, I think more on the scientific um, studies and ends like assistive technology uh, as well as some of the models in occupational therapy have been extremely, like I think, valuable as a designer to reference. So that's kind of something I've been working on. And it's just, uh, again, I'm unlearning and learning, unlearning some more and <laughs> learning some more. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Um, you mentioned actually the uh, patent database and history of clothing design and this um, this notion of things sort of uh, you know turning towards the the political. Your work is never really explicitly though necessarily uh, political. You sort of approach this topic of really uh, this notion of style and of self expression, but I I, I kind of want to say actually that that this is a, a certain area, especially for, for, for disabled people, that is still like actually rather deeply political, right? In, in terms of, um, you know, equity and in terms of access to the full modalities of human expression. And, you know, it, it, it's the type of thing that, yes, is so self-evident that maybe, you know, you kind of think that that doesn't need to be stated, but you know this is this is kind of a deeply political sort of you know revolutionary act to to be able to claim this space to to occupy and be in. And I, I'm wondering what you what you think about that, or how you sort of uh, you know how, how you feel feel about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much aligned. I think um, being able to express yourself is a fundamental right, especially if um, as a human being living in America, you know. I won't get into the politics of America right now, <laughs> just go vote. Um, but I think really having that power to express yourself is super important. And clothing is one of the ways that it facilitates that and your sense of style, your identity. Where it really collides, I think, is workwear. And so if you look at employment and you are being hired uh, to wear a uniform, but that uniform is not designed for your disabilities, your needs, and your body, you know, is it preventing you from getting the work that you should be able to do? And so I think that's something where it does get kind of uh, political <laughs> and it is about this design for social good, but no, really it could make change and change is needed when all of us are aging uh, and all of us will probably experience some kind of disability at some point in our life. So I agree with you. I didn't do you ever, just want to say it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, do you, do you ever encounter any, um, any friction in, in the work that you, you've done. I mean, I, I think that it's so clear from major 
uh, magazines, media outlets, retailers, and, and really just all the kind of press and uh, awards and recognition that your work has received, that uh, it's clearly well received. And yet at the same time, it's not as if we actually have fully accessible clothing uh, for people with disabilities out there. This, this hasn't you know, this hasn't yet been able to make its way out there. So it, to the regular, to regular shops, to regular retailers. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, that, that experience of, you know, having, having your work being so well received, but then, you know, having the friction of it, if it not being realized, right, fully to, to be accessible for everybody. Yeah, I think that's what makes this space exciting because I don't want to be the only person that is championing or researching in this space. There is so much room for so many more people to be involved to push the needle forward until we actually see it in more everyday stores. But this is really like a, a retail and scale question, which I always get in some event or classroom. <laughs> There's that guy that's from corporate America that asks, is this available in stores? Um, is this affordable? And how do we get that there? And I'd like to kind of touch a little bit about that um, from my book. And I talk about various scales of business and how, you know, you've seen in slow fashion as well, different ways where things are being handcrafted and also sold, whether they're customized, bespoke, or produced in large numbers. There needs to be other ways of thinking about vertical scaling and, of course, different ways of scaling. And so I challenge, you know, that question to, to ask more people you know, how can you think of disseminating your work in uh, a way that's unique to you and for your audience without, I think, the overwhelming responsibility that I need to produce millions, <laughs> like some of the bigger companies. Um, maybe it takes the collaboration with a retail company, right? Or it takes um, different types of approaches, but there's just so many options. And I think nobody really has an answer as of now, like what's the best. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I'll leave it to the, the students and, I'll, and the alumni to, to think of some of those kind of solutions with us. Yeah, I'm going to ask if we have any other questions from the audience here. We're coming down to the five minute mark. So if you have a question and you've been holding on to it, now is the time to uh, release it into the chat or uh, unmute yourself and, and ask. <laughs> All right, I, I liked what you were saying, Grace, about reframing, reframing the questions, right? Um, that if we're thinking in this frame of manufacturing at scale and you know, large retailers, then uh, you, you have these kinds of scale and uh, economic concerns, but that really maybe some of some of the solutions actually lie in reframing those questions and rethinking the particular way in which um, businesses can can operate. Have you um, in your conversations with uh, you know these companies uh, that you've partnered with for for events and for workshops, um, what kind of conversations have you had with them? Do you find that they are amenable to uh, reframing and rethinking, or do you find that you are encountering people who are more sort of small, um, you know, business owners, smaller companies who have the ability to be more responsive and nimble? Is, is that really where the, the kind of action is at? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a range um, from small business owners, like freelance designers to larger corporations. But I would say probably one of the earliest challenges was like talking about the value of designing with disability in the first place, especially for larger corporations. And I think it's changed a lot, that conversation with um, DEI initiatives and like diversity, equity and inclusion, all of those kind of other things that are popping up, I think, in other corporations are helping. Um, but of course, there's still a lot. There's always room to learn. And I think now... More, more and more people are kind of picking up on those opportunities, whether it's inside the company or externally. So I see it in both and wide ranges, uh, but it's becoming more, I think, um, more interesting and I think more engaging as of now. 
uh, than it was maybe like five years ago. Um, we have just a few more minutes, so I am going to ask you a maybe somewhat off topic and fun question. But you know, you you are a graduate of uh, design and technology, and uh, you have spent a significant amount of time uh, in New York City. And in our program, as you know, we have so many people who come from outside of New York and spend uh, a wonderful, meaningful amount of time with us here. What would you say to uh, first first year students who are here in New York for the first time? What what's something that they should absolutely not miss? <laughs> that they should go out and experience and do. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, first of all, just go around the corner, get essay bagel. <laughs> I don't think there's like good bagels in, here in Atlanta, Georgia, but um, definitely take advantage of the essay bagel and your discount at Bread's Bakery. <laughs> um, but other than that, I think really um, look at some of the culture. Like I went to a lot of exhibitions uh, and I think when I was working, but prior to coming to DT, I never really had that time other than weekends. But finally, when I was a student, I was like, I'm going to go to every museum, every exhibition that pops up uh, as much as possible. And even though it wasn't in my research topic or, you know, exactly the things I was interested in, it was it was so great because it's such a resource and opportunity. Excellent advice. <laughs> So I want to say thank you so much, Grace, for uh, you know spending time with us, uh, for joining us here in Cloud Salon, and um, I just want to you know again say it's so great to actually see you. Thank you for coming to visit with us, and for everybody out there uh, watching, um, please uh, don't forget that in two more weeks we will have a another Cloud Salon, and I want to give thanks to the MFA Design and Technology Program, the BFA Design and Technology Program, our intrepid leaders, Colleen, Macklin, Sven, Travis, who direct the MFA DT, and uh, Melanie Crean, who directs BFA Design and Technology. So thank you so much, Grace. It was wonderful to hear you speak. And um, yeah, we, we, we give our virtual claps to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much.